Good afternoon to those in Manitoba. Good morning to our distinguished guests. Uh, my name is Gerard Kennedy, and I am chair of the Distinguished Visitors Committee here at Robson Hall, the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Law. As mentioned, I'm in Manitoba. Uh, specifically, I'm on Treaty 1 territory on the original lands of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Like all Indigenous peoples, uh, these peoples who have historically called what we now call Winnipeg home have the right to self-determination. And I'm deeply honored to be welcoming virtually to Robson Hall, one of the world's leading scholars on Indigenous rights generally and self-determination in particular. Megan Davis is Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous and a Professor of Law at the University of New South Wales. Summarizing Professor Davis's biography is no easy task. She is a constitutional lawyer who researches and teaches in public law and public international law. And her research focuses on constitutional design, democratic theory, and indigenous peoples. Her expertise and character have been reflected in the number of appointments she has held outside the university, including, and believe you me, I had to whittle down the list, serving as an expert member with the UN Human Rights Council's expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, being acting commissioner, on the New South Wales Land and Environmental Court, serving as chair of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and being special rapporteur on an optional protocol to UNDRIP, participating in the drafting of UNDRIP, being appointed by the Prime Minister of Australia to the Referendum Council, and designing the deliberative constitutional dialogue that it undertook, being appointed to the Prime Minister's expert panel on recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples in the Australian Constitution, and being awarded the overall winner in the 2018 Australian Financial Review's Women of Influence. I could go on. We are truly fortunate to have Dr. Davis with us here today. Uh, just to remind everyone, this session is being recorded. Uh, and with that, it's my enormous honor to be handing over the session to Dr. Davis, who will be giving us global reflections on the right to self-determination after the Trump era. Thank you very much. Thank you. I do Zooms all the time and I'm like looking around for the mute because I don't know where it is. Thank you for that kind introduction, Jared, and hello to everyone and in particular my old friend Brenda Gunn. I, I've been out your way um, a couple of times to, 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 to Winnipeg um, and both times in the snow, Brenda, um, which as Brenda knows I'm obsessed with. Brenda spent some time out in Australia with me um, at the University of New South Wales University of Technology Sydney as well, where we did a lot of research on um, free trade agreements and Indigenous peoples, as well as we participated in the drafting of the declaration together. So Brenda has spent a fair bit of time in the heat out here, and um, and I've, I've spent a fair bit of time in the snow over there, which, um, which, which I love, but I'm not sure I'd be very good at living in. Um, so I'm reading in from very early Brisbane time in Sydney, where of course it's summer and very hot. Um, and it's nice to be with all of you. And I can see some of my colleagues from UNSW Sydney also ringing in, which is nice of them um, to ring in so early. Um, so the title, um, and thank you for having me. I, th I think my talk, at least the title um, made my talk sound much more dra dramatic than it, than it is. When I employed the language of um, Trump era, and I was reflecting on it later, thinking, oh, sounds far more um, important. Um, uh, well, it's important, but um, um, I, I was asked to send the title a bit around the time Joe Biden took office. So I thought it was an appropriate kind of um, uh, line in the sand to, to reflect, at least globally, on the right to self-determination. Um, but it is important, I think, to understand the wide ranging impact of the Trump administration on our very interconnected world. Um, as a UN expert on the expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples, um, that is a, a body that sits under the UN Human Rights Council, it's, um, it's fair to say that the four years of the Trump administration had a really very serious um, and detrimental impact upon the functioning of the United Nations the international human rights law system, both in terms of states' obligations to human rights um, and in terms of the administration of the system of uh, scrutiny by the United Nations and the practice of um, 
human rights, and in particular the rights of human rights defenders. Um, I think um, many of the things that he said and did um, absolutely um, emboldened those um, who uh, have a tendency to, to suppress um, and subjugate um, that work of human rights defenders around the world. But it wasn't just the human rights system that um, we saw rendered somewhat frail during this period, but also um, the international trade uh, law system, international financial institutions, the World Trade Organization, the erratic behavior of Trump also very much threatened, you know, much of that post-World War II Washington consensus um, in a number of ways. Those twin pillars of the United Nations, peace and security. And, um, and we know post-World War II with the creation of the United Nations that peace and security was really at the heart of this rules-based system um, and this parallel system that developed out of Bretton Woods um, insofar as trade. We knew that trade conflict was at the heart of many wars and conflicts between states. Um, and it became very difficult to teach international human rights law, which I've taught over two decades, because we became further and further away from the kinds of um, uh, reasons for the creation of the United Nations and that international system, however flawed it was and it is. Um, you know, so much so I was relying so much on, you know, YouTube to, to bring up pictures of um, World War II and, and the Nuremberg trials and, and many of the things that, um, you know, the, the, the young students that come through our classrooms um, uh, often don't know about or read about before they come into our classes. Um, and certainly as an international human rights law academic, I've always been highly critical of the international trade law system, for example, and um, the relative unfairness of WTO laws. Um, but I think, I think for many United Nations experts and for many people, um, this period um, um, has been challenging because while um, the system can be scrutinised and is flawed, you could also finally, well not finally appreciate, but appreciate the importance of rules and a rules-based system that does get people to the table to talk. Um, and so we could see as UN experts the impact that authoritarian regimes in particular um, uh, who were emboldened by Trump, the, the impact of those regimes on Indigenous peoples and Indigenous rights. Um, and that is very much the core of our, or at least my work on the expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples. And we also watched as um, Trump sought to wind back the rights of Indigenous peoples within his own country. So I think um, when I was you know, pulling together my thoughts on, on this talk, I wanted to reflect on, I suppose, this um, period that gave us even greater insight into the fragility of both the international law system and um, indeed democratic governance and the rule of law in Western liberal democracies um, or liberal democracies. Um, and certainly one would never have thought the day that there would be people that would proudly proclaim themselves as Western illiberal democracies, but that is the case. Um, so I suppose I wanted to reflect on that in the context of Indigenous people's rights and self-determination. Um, so I'll probably break my comments into two parts, the first being reflections on the system of international law, the UN and peace and security, and then the second being reflections on Indigenous peoples um, and, and the right to self-determination. And they're very kind of early discursive rough thoughts. Um, as I am writing um, a book on, on this. But um, uh, um, in particular, I'm, I'm interested in what this post-Trump era looks like in, in terms of the realisation of the right to self-determination um, as we move into a kind of different phase as Indigenous peoples and the Declaration and the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where, you know, we're no longer just kind of 10 years post adoption of the drip by the General Assembly, we're 15 years down the road. Um, and so um, it'll be interesting to see um, the reaction of liberal democracies to 
um, what was a very serious challenge to what we've regarded as, as, as something that can't be challenged and how that impacts upon Indigenous peoples' uh, platform and advocacy for reform within their own country. Um, so, for example, you know, we follow closely, um, not in a very nuanced and in-depth way, but um, things that happen in the US and Canada insofar as Indigenous peoples' rights. We know in New Zealand they're undergoing a constitutional recognition or transformation process. And similarly, uh, in, in Australia, um, I, I, Brenda knows this, but I mean, people do look to Canada as a best practice example of Indigenous people's rights. Um, in Australia, there is no treaty agreement and, and none has, no, has ever been signed. Um, there are no constitutional um, rights or recognition. There is no Bill of Rights or Charter of Rights. It's an interesting country in which it is a affluent high income country, um, but with very serious third world conditions in um, many remote Aboriginal communities and a complete paucity of recognition of rights outside of statutes that we know are vulnerable to um, state, territory and Commonwealth override. In recent years, there's been a very serious reform agenda, constitutional reform agenda um, that was issued by the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which was signed by um, many First Nations peoples across Australia um, after the Referendum Council in Australia set up a process to ask First Nations peoples what form of recognition they want in the Australian Constitution. And the answer was a, an enshrined um, uh, in First Nations voice to the Parliament when I say enshrined, protected by the Australian Constitution in a way that it cannot be repealed or abolished. Um, and so I've turned my mind to, to you know, what, what are the consequences or the impact of that Trump era upon things like Indigenous peoples' um, advocacy for the realisation of the Declaration 15 years down the track since this was international um, consensus. So just on the first kind of part and generally uh, my reflections on um, the system, I'm, I myself have spent 23, 23 years involved in the UN system. I started um, quite, quite young. Um, I hadn't yet finished law school when I um, received a United Nations Fellowship to the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And so my, my experience has been, you know, across two decades, but but certainly at a, a very young age working in the UN system. Um, but, I, but I've had multiple iterations in that UN system too. You know, I've been Aboriginal um, activist or advocate, an Aboriginal lawyer who represented the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission in Australia in the drafting of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, I studied my master's at the Australian National University in international law and similarly did a PhD on Indigenous peoples' right to self-determination um, at ANU. And then I've had this decade experience as the expert member of both the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and as a United Nations expert member um, of the expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples. So I have a particular kind of perspective um, arising out of that um, relatively unique experience. Um, and I refer to that just simply because that, that is, what, is what informs my reflections on, um, um, on self-determination now in, in international law in this kind of post-Trump era. And, and, I'm, and I suppose I'm referring to that because when you do a UN fellowship and the United Nations has set up a very successful Indigenous fellowship system, through the High Commissioner for Human Rights, where young Indigenous um, advocates are sent by their organisations um, to uh, participate um, in this fellowship that teaches you everything about how the UN system works. We, um, we were fortunate to have a six to eight month stay in Geneva um, to, to, to ensure that more people experience the fellowship. And that was only four of us. The UN now, um, you know, does it over a car period of one or two weeks. So we were very lucky to, to, you know, spend almost a year in Geneva learning how the system works, learning how the ropes work. We spent a month in UNESCO in Paris. We worked for a month in the ILO in Geneva. 
participated in the drafting of the declaration from everything from participating to running the speakers list as, as, as young interns, I suppose, and learning how the system works and, it's, it's, you know, equipping us with those skills um, to become um, successful advocates at home and at the UN. And, and when I did return from Australia after that fellowship, I did have a very uncritical approach to the international human rights law system. Um, and it wasn't until I started doing the Masters of International Law and my PhD that I was able to develop a critical lens about the international human rights law system and its limitations, particularly for Indigenous peoples. Um, but again, um, having been a kind of UN expert in that bureaucratic system for 10 years, um, I'd become hardened again to, to the UN and very hypercritical of the bureaucracy and its um, very slow capacity to change. Um, and, um, and, and the past four years has caused me to pause on the fragility of all of that system, not only in the practice of international law, but the belief in international law and how easily a system can really turn on a dime. Prior to COVID and prior to Trump, there were many academic challenges um, and other challenges to the UN human rights system and the UN system. For example, in human rights, the questioning of the philosophical coherency of human rights led by scholars such as you know, Samuel Moyne, but even earlier than him, Mikhail Matui wrote in 2001 on the savages, victims and saviors metaphor of, metaphor of human rights, which as a junior scholar, I found um, really compelling this grand narrative of human rights, which has a subtext, which depicts an epochal contest, pitting savages on the one hand against the victims and saviors on the other. Um, and Matur was writing decades before the very, it's obviously very fashionable now to critique the human rights system um, in the university or in the academy. Um, um, but he was light years ahead in asking human rights thinkers and advocates to be a little bit more self-reflective and think of the ways in which they, they do other, um, the, the people who are the recipients of international human rights law. I have to apologise, my mum, I've been in prison caring for my mum and somebody is mowing their lawn. So these are the, um, normally <laughs> I will be in my university institution, but these, these are the, 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 the realities of suburban um, and it, a tiny housing commission estate. So I, I, I'm hoping it's not interfering with anyone's, everybody can hear, um, it's annoying me. But anyway, as long as it's not annoying anyone else. Um, so, um, so we have very important challenges to the UN system. Um, ones that aligned with me as an indigenous lawyer and thinker about the UN system, its close relationship with capital, its promotion of neoliberal policies as being central to the achievement of human rights particularly in the development field. I remember feeling somewhat enraged <laughs> during the 70th anniversary of the UN system when Angry Bird was sitting in the General Assembly. Um, the criticisms of the UN's relationships with elites and tyrannical regimes and celebrities, you know, all of, all of the books and articles and journal articles and TED Talks that had spoken to this, um, I found very compelling um, and, and very much agreed with. Um, but then having said that, um, having sat through um, four years of, of the UN system creaking to a halt of the, the income that the UN or the US provided to the UN creaking to a halt and the UN having to figure out ways in which it needs to redistribute money across the system and, and thinking and reflecting upon all of those communities of the world that desperately need UN assistance from um, um, not just development, but peacekeeping. And there's a lot of work that is done in that space. Um, there were many challenges brought to bear on the UN system that weren't visible to many people um, in the world. And it makes one reflect on the phrase once um, spoken by the former UN Special Rapporteur, Doug Hammarskjöld, when he said that the United Nations was not created to take mankind to heaven, but to save humanity from hell. Um, because it is a very imperfect system, um, but it is very much like um, humankind is. It's imperfect. People fight, people don't get on, but the principle is that it should matter, should be mediated um, through talking with each other, through diplomacy, 
And after six years as a UN Permanent Forum member, I worked on UN, ref UN reform agenda, along with Daly Sambo de Rowe from the Inuit Circumpolar Conference. Daly and I'd worked very, very hard on a reform agenda to try and improve the way the Permanent Forum did its work. And we just became so exhausted after six years by this bureaucracy that is the UN. It's cumbersome, it's slow, and it's very resistant to change. And, um, and then to that end, becoming an MRIP expert was liberating because it was expert driven and engaged in much more in-depth discussion of legal issues and political issues facing Indigenous peoples. But without being a Pollyanna, that, that period, that four years of Trump has forced um, me not to change my perspective on the bureaucracy and the, the over-regulation of the UN, but the importance of these mechanisms, despite my frustrations with the system. Um, as I said, it's not perfect, but the alternative is far worse to contemplate. The MRIP in particular, I think, is, is a shining example of that because it has a particular mandate that does involve country visits and being asked to visit countries and resolve disputes. And this work um, of the UN is critical to travel to difficult places um, and encounter difficult situations and difficult problems and to bring an outside human rights based perspective from the UN and for us as experts of MRIP, um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and Indigenous Rights, we bring that to bear on, on these in-country disputes that we contribute to resolving. And um, so only recently, um, uh, the MRIP had its country engagement mandate altered so that it could be more hands-on and pragmatic as a UN body um, to help states and Indigenous peoples realise the aims of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we do that at the request of either Indigenous peoples or states or both. It's a very novel and innovative mechanism. Um, and that's done through the provision of dialogue, facilitation, technical cooperation and capacity building. Um, and it's a mandate uh, that is um, a collaborative process between MRIP Indigenous peoples in the state. And um, we've taken undertaken country engagement so far with Finland, New Zealand, Sweden, Mexico City, and, and currently a number of states, which I can't, obviously can't mention in the core, but on different rights in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so I suppose just in terms of that first element in the broader international law um, area and reflections on it post um, Trump, that role of peace um, and diplomacy and its role that it takes in keeping a lid on tensions. Um, it's interesting as a scholar of 20 years in this field, you do, you can take it for granted. Um, and, um, and, it, and, it, and it really has, um, as I said, I, I still believe very much in the kind of inconsistencies and challenges and flaws of the system. But um, it has made me, I suppose, not appreciate, but understand um, even more the exigency of the United Nations and that international system um, in maintaining peace. And so that brings me to the kind of heart of the comments I wanted to make in that is the way in which Indigenous peoples um, uh, have shaped and reshaped liberal democracies around the world using this United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll move on to those reflections since uh, Brendan's given me a, the 20, 20 minute mark. Um, and um, so as, I, as I've kind of foreshadowed, what I'm interested in um, now, um, given that the expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples is now doing the first United Nations study on the right to self-determination for Indigenous peoples, which is, which is very historic. I am interested, um, um, I am very much interested in uh, what the right to self-determination for Indigenous peoples might look like post-Trump. Um, post Indigenous peoples around the world, we, as we know, invoke the right to self-determination as that normative uh, basis of their relationship with the state. And, and this, of course, as I've said, has been um, uh, influenced by the development of international human rights law and in Indigenous peoples' engagement with the UN. And so for most Indigenous peoples, the right to self-determination involves exercising 
control over their own communities and participating in decision-making processes and the design of policies and programs that affect their communities. Um, and then apart from kind of the internal processes of Indigenous peoples, there is that connection to the state. What does that look like? Um, how do Indigenous peoples relate to the state? How do they give input to the state? Um, and where does that sit? Does it sit in the constitution? Does it sit in statute? Does it sit in policy? Um, our, our report on self-determination comes at a really critical time, I think, in terms of the United Nations um, uh, work on Indigenous peoples' rights, but it also when you look across, you know, the multiple jurisdictions of the United Nations, um, where we have, you know, 194 odd UN member states, I should know that precisely, um, and approximately 70 to 80 that have really significant Indigenous populations in which um, they have accommodated th that Indigenous um, uh, voice um, or mechanisms within the framework of the state to enhance Indigenous participation in the state, um, primarily because the bulk of those countries, not all, um, um, involve communities that um, have small numbers um, and therefore, as we know, succumb to the majoritarian nature of liberal democracy, particularly those, um, well, not those, but all of those that are predicated upon the ballot box which, which does mean that the party politics that defines parliamentary democracy is very much um, targeted at the, at, the, at the mean, at the middle. And Indigenous peoples always, always fall outside of, of that. And most liberal democracies have put their minds to how you address that. Um, do you address it in the constitution through constitutional rights? Do you set it up in um, do you set up some form of mechanism via statute that allows Indigenous peoples um, to have better import or do you, um, or, or does that involve designated seats or reserve seats? There's multiple ways that the world has considered this. Um, and so part of what we're doing this year um, um, is putting some meat on the bones of the right to self-determination so that things are no longer as theoretical as they seem to be when I look at a lot of the literature that is written in this field, and there is a lot, um, but rather a more um, uh, nuanced picture of, of what, it, what it looks like, the realisation of the right to self-determination um, across the world. Um, and, and the fact that for many, many decades, we've tried to have a study on the right to self-determination in the UN system, and it has not been allowed by the UN system because of the sensitivities around the right to self-determination and the former controversy of the right to self-determination. I think, I think the fact that the Human Rights Council let this study through speaks to the acceptance within the UN system of the Indigenous people's right to self-determination. I think it does speak to the acceptance of that. And, um, and, and, and when I, I yesterday I asked a RA just to quickly pull as much as she could of the 28, 29, 2020 kind of literature on the right to self-determination. And, um, and much of it reflects what my students, right? And that is people are stuck in 2007. People are stuck at the drafting of the declaration. It's still this kind of Kansas didn't vote yes. Um, self-determination is really controversial. Um, but in reality, international law, public international law and um, Indigenous peoples' communities and their relationship with state ha have moved on past that. Self-determination does, as we know, have a very lengthy history in um, international law, but, but this study on the right of self-determination for Indigenous peoples without states getting skittish about the possibility of secession says a lot about where we have come. Um, and in the previous UN seminar I was just on, I made the point that it's not insignificant the change that Indigenous peoples have brought to international law. Um, Indigenous peoples have changed the nature of public international law in this field. Um, and so the question now is how has that Indigenous peoples kind of, the, the shifting notion of the right to self-determination in international law, what, ha what, what has that brought to bear on democratic governance? How have we influenced really at that grassroots level, the state level, um, um, what democratic governance looks like and the structures that are in place 
to provide voice to Indigenous people's rights and people and Indigenous people's advocacy. advocacy. Um, and so, of course, as a constitutional lawyer, I'm interested in how Indigenous peoples um, via the right to self-determination are accommodated or recognised within the framework of the state. Um, and and as, as we know, there's been a great reluctance um, on this in the past, but I do wonder, given the very recent kind of amplification of the very thinness, the fragility of the rule of law and a lot of these um, democratic systems that we took for granted, whether that will hinder Indigenous people's advocacy and struggle for better or further realisation of self-determination, whether it will hinder it or whether it will actually accelerate some of these reforms that people have been seeking. Um, Brenda, how much longer do we have? I don't want to launch into a big lecture on the right to democratic governance and international <laughs> law without just keeping an eye. Well, uh, I think we would all enjoy that. I, we're getting close to 30 minutes. So I think um, it, if you have a short lecture, we would love to hear it or you're welcome to wrap up and we can move to questions. It's it's really up to you, Megan. Yep, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Brenda. Um, I won't go, I'll, I'll skip over the norm of democratic governance. Um, the reason why I wanted to emphasize that is, um, um, is, is to, kind of just reinforce um, the shifting tide of self-determination over um, uh, that historical kind of period where um, it has shifted from the kind of 1960s decolonization um, context to the right to self-determination is set out in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the uh, International Covenant on Economic and Social Cultural Rights in 1966. Um, and then we saw this kind of forward kind of evolution of self-determination manifest itself in 1970 with the Declaration on Friendly Relations. Um, so we've seen through uh, the UN system this ever-evolving notion of um, the right to self-determination. And I wanted to kind of bring us through the democratisation of self-determination um, in that kind of post Cold, Cold War environment um, where the focus of self-determination came to be directed more to the internal governance of states um, as an aspect of self-determination. Um, and, and many of you would have read and know about um, Thomas Frank and his postulated self-determination as it being at the core of um, the democratic entitlement um, and he sought of course, to establish democratic governance as a normative rule of the international system. And look, that plays out in the UN system, the, the international system in terms of the norm of democratic governance, which is said to derive from the right to political participation as established in the UN Charter and established in Article 21 of the UN um, Declaration on Human Rights and Article 25 of the ICC par, ICCPR around um, citizens participating in public affairs directly or through um, freely chosen representatives about free and fair periodic multi-party elections. All of these things embody this entitlement. And we, we know then that we saw that this democratization of self-determination um, signaling or signaled a shift in international law's understanding of the right to self-determination from decolonization to democratization. And that, of course, was bolstered by the support of major institutions, many of which um, many are critical of, such as the European Union and the Organization of American States, who require political democracy as a condition of membership um, and use democratization as a kind of carrot and stick approach with respect to legal recognition of new states and government, governance or the provision of development aid and certainly the um, international financial institutions and structural adjustment, all of these required democratization, but very much coupled with uh, a, a neoliberal um, um, uh, uh, market economy. Um, things that um, on the one hand uh, look like they are bringing voice and self-determination to peoples, but at the other, on the other hand um, ha have in the past tied um, parliaments hands behind their back 
um, insofar as that um, market liberalisation, which has been, has had a very acute and harsh impact upon um, their citizens and certainly upon Indigenous peoples um, across the world. But this democratisation of self-determination is very much embedded in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And it, as I said, it's come after, after much ambivalence of international law towards self-determination and the ambiguity of its status as a legal right, given it obviously has evolved from a political principle to a legal right following that period of decolonisation and the Friendly Relations Declaration in 1961. Um, and so that really kind of, that shifting sands of self-determination um, requires us to ask or to take stock of where we are now. Um, where is the right of self-determination now as influenced by Indigenous peoples post-declaration 15 years on? And will the pressure that has been brought to bear on many democracies and the rule of law have an impact on the state's willingness to come to the table in terms of um, the reforms that Indigenous peoples seek that are required, the structural reforms, the redistribution of power that's required for Indigenous peoples to achieve their aspirations? Um, you know, will it have an impact upon states' willingness to have Indigenous peoples have an enhanced participation in the democratic life of the state? Um, but also, you know, in the post-Trump world, um, will the kind of challenge to um, liberal democracy and the fragility of that system, um, Will it accelerate arguments and advocacy for the recognition of Indigenous laws and sovereignty? Um, so recognition used to be a very large law reform agenda in Australia, but now very rarely mentioned. And is it the case that we will forget the fear and anxiety felt regarding the thinness of constitutionalism and courts and the easy way in which fear and misinformation can manipulate people into attempting to overthrow a legal and political order that is, you know, much admired around the world as well as much criticised and much scrutinised. I mean, I recall watching CNN just thinking, you know, all Australians are up at like 6am just going, what on earth is happening? Could this really, really happen? And so how will liberal democracies respond? Will it be business as usual? Will it be status quo? Or will it be moving towards realising that what we are told is the transformative potential and emancipatory potential of democracy? Or is it that that potential is as elusive today as it was pre-Trump? And I'll just end by bringing it back to, um, back to the work in Australia on constitutional recognition and, and the Uluru Statement from the heart as, as we, as um, First Nations people in Australia, you know, seek to um, seek to advocate and have implemented structural reform that has not happened in Australia. As I said, we don't have a treaty or treaties. Um, we don't have any constitutionally enshrined rights. We don't have any Bill of Rights or Charter of Rights apart from a ad hoc number of common law rights. Um, will what has happened in the world um, um, have an impact on the state's you know, propensity to come to the table on these big reforms that are required to see the right to self-determination as, as passed by the world in 2007 in the General Assembly, you know, 15 years take, taken up to a new gear. So it's not just reflections on the Kansas voting record of 2007, but actual implementation of the declaration that changes people's lives on the ground, because that at the end of the day is what it is all about. Uh, Brenda, I'll just stop there in the interest of questions and time. Thanks, Megan. Uh, that was really wonderful. I'm really appreciative of your comments that highlighted how the system of the United Nations that we always, you know, that many people view as sort of the strong and like the powerhouse, how fragile it actually is and how um, the internal um, workings of one state can really have these ripple effects. 
but it also really had me thinking about how hard Indigenous peoples have really had to fight for recognition of, you know, of their rights at every step of the way and how easy the slide back can happen, right? That, you know, you have 30 years of advocacy and some really great strides. And, and I think we have um, a few minutes and I'm not sure if we want to end things here, but I was going to ask Megan to see if she wanted to try to um, perhaps give us one last reflection on um, moving us to the Uluru Statement of uh, uh, in, that happened in Australia is just, I think it was a moment that many Indigenous people saw around the world and wanted to um, really um, galvanize around. I think it got a lot of attention and I'm just uh, wondering if um, you had any last thoughts on um, sort of where do we move after the Uluru Statement? Because I think it was such a beautiful moment of asserting self-determination in a state. And, you know, as I said, gathered a lot of international attention. And I think the question um, now is, and, and, and how do we move from here? And I don't know if you can provide us a short update on sort of what's happening now domestically in Australia to, to move past that uh, galvanizing moment to, uh, try to keep the momentum of that work going forward. Yeah, thanks, Brenda, and thanks for your comments, because I think, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, we look at so much work that is um, directed to um, the advocacy and realisation of our rights and, and, um, and in all of that work that's done at that UN level to, to, to just be reminded of, of the fragility of that system. Um, I think a lot of people are reflecting on it in terms of how we go forward in advocacy um, for, for our rights at both that international level and that domestic level. Um, but also, Brenda, I think it's really interesting to reflect too on, um, for example, the work that we have done on free trade agreements and trade agreements 20 years ago is brought to bear now, right? So, um, you know, we can say things in Indigenous forums and write things like we've done in special journals and all of the work collaborative work we've done on trade and um, states in the UN system will kind of listen but um, you know a couple of decades down the track everything that we said would happen or predicted has come true you know all of the problems and the challenges of those systems of the unfairness of it um, um, as well as the opportunities um, um, have brought to bear and I think that that speaks very much to the to the utility and the importance of Indigenous advocacy and work in, in that sphere. Um, on the Uluru Statement from the Heart, it's interesting because, um, you know, we, it, is a, it is a country that is, is unique in that, um, that there, are, there are very few outside of the smattering of statutory rights. There's very few substantive kind of um, very little substantive recognition of Indigenous peoples and their collective rights. And um, this Uluru Statement from the Heart comes after, you know, a decade, this is the 11th year decade process of state funded, state mandated processes to ask Indigenous people what form of constitutional recognition they want. Um, and, and there's frustration, of course, in, in the community that the state often enlists these processes as a performative thing. Um, that is to say, they look like they're providing people with an opportunity to have a voice, um, um, but they, at the end of the day, have no intention of implementing what happens in those processes. Um, and that can be very exhausting for communities who are, who are asked to, to comment and contribute on multiple, you know, as you would know in a federation, multiple processes in many subject matter areas. Um, to, to the state, un, you know, unpaid, um, and um, for, for, for it to not come to a free fruition. What's happened with the Uluru Statement, um, you know, really constitutional recognition has been on the books for about two decades, even though it's only a decade in which we've had, you know, five processes and eight re formal government reports in 10 years. It's a lot of constitutional recognition where people have asked for a framework of reform known as voice, treaty and truth. 
So a constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament, um, a Makarata Commission or a Treaty Commission that will implement truth telling and treaty agree agreement making across the continent. Um, but what we've seen is, is a process that has kind of hijacked that reform. Um, we had a gov the current government committed to the, a referendum on, on this voice. Um, after there was a process, a co-design process in which Indigenous peoples, the Australian people and politicians just put more meat on the bones of the voice. What does it look like before people vote in a referendum to change the constitution? Um, that process is going on now. Um, we have more meat on the bones, um, but we have the first Aboriginal Minister for Indigenous Affairs who's saying he would prefer just a legislated voice and he wants symbolic recognition in the constitution. So he's unilaterally um, kind of deviated from what their formal election policy is um, and what their policy is. So we've got a voice interim report that they kindly handed down in January when everybody's on school holidays. Um, um, so that Indigenous communities have approximately 11 weeks, now eight weeks, to provide substantive feedback on a very complex design of a voice to Parliament. Um, it's a, the, the report sets out a voice to government and a voice to Parliament. So it sets out the, the, the bureaucratic mechanism in which current and existing Indigenous organisations and entities can, can enhance the work of the bureaucracy. And then the top level voice to parliament is intended to be the voice to parliament that people ask for at Uluru, but fell, falls well short because it's mediated by the government of the day. So what they've done is taken the status quo and they've kind of fashioned it into a, a system um, with a lot of, as I've said in a newspaper last week, a lot of squiggly lines and fancy flow charts um, but it's very much the status quo. So it's interesting um, that most Australians, and there's a large um, percentage of Australians through our polling and non-Indigenous, um, uh, sorry, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians who support a constitutionally enshrined voice. So we're going to get to a very difficult situation here where there's an expectation of the people that this is a constitutionalised voice, um, but the state does as it always has done, and that is it, it quashes attempts um, by Indigenous peoples for more substantive rights. And, and that's really where, where we are. And I think um, the last substantive United Nations appraisal of, of Australia was Vicky Talley Corpus's report, her in Australia country report, where she lamented again, the lack of self-determination in Australia. The Australian government refers to it as a principle of self-determination. There is no implementation of the declaration in Australia, along with, um, as Vicky remarked, the lack of treaties, the lack of enshrined rights and no recognition leaves for a very bleak political and legal landscape for Indigenous peoples. Um, so we're really lagging behind on that. Um, and so we've got to work hard to make sure that this current process is an opportunity to, 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 to show the Australian government that anything less than constitutional recognition will not change people's lives. Um, and that's, as I said before, that's key really, is, is how do you transform people's lives in communities on the ground? I think well, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Adele here sure. to wrap us up. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Davis, for that um, remarkable talk. My name is Adele Perry, and I'm a professor in the Departments of History and Women's and Gender Studies. And more importantly, in this capacity, I am the director for the Center for Human Rights Research. And we have been really honored um, to be working with these meetings that have been, have been organized uh, by Professor Brenda Gunn and Celeste McKay. And we are especially honored to be working with um, the Faculty of Laws distinguished visitor um, series um, to bring to you, I think, which was a really remarkable opportunity to hear uh, Professor Davis speak in such grounded and erudite terms about the difficult present and the complicated present that we are all in, um, in general, and with particular regards to rights to self-determination around um, the Indigenous world. And so I will just say a, um, a huge thank you, uh, Chime Gwich and a grand merci for um, your talk and for this opportunity um, for us to learn from you, which we're really honored to have had.
So thank you very much for Professor Davis for getting up early, for coming to us from tomorrow, uh, for your, really for your thoughts and for your wisdom and for um, sharing that with us. Thank you very much.